All right. Looks like I'm the uh, last thing in the way for uh, tonight's festivities. So I'll uh, try to uh, make it interesting. Um, at lunchtime, I was having a conversation with someone. I was asking them how this conference is compa uh, compares to some other conferences had uh, been to, like Ruby and stuff. And he said that this conference is, uh, there's not as much rah, rah, rah. And he was blaming it on, the, the I guess, the maturity of the language and, and so on, right? So uh, I thought it's appropriate that we do some rah, rah, rah for Elixir. So uh, let's hear for Elixir. Uh, I know I'm, I'm uh, just ecstatic about the language. I, it's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. I'm having a great time dr programming in it. Uh, remember my password here. So I am going to talk to you about... Uh, about real-time concurrent embedded project uh, in enterprise cell phones. Uh, who here knows, who here has actually thought about what's involved when you make a telephone call on, uh, let's say, at the office? You really thought about that? You do, you think about that all the time? Yeah, you told me that last night, so. Uh, so you lift up the handset, and I'm going to do my best not to kind of bog you down in all the uh, telco lingo here. But you know, lift up your handset and you hear dial tone. Okay, well, messages come into the, uh, into the call server. We figure out what telephone it is. Uh, then we actually have to go and talk to a tone generator, um, tell what, what kind of tone. We have to switch that to the speech path so it actually comes out your ear. Okay, you hit a, and you hit a, uh, a key to start dialing. So you hit a digit and we have to stop the dial tone. Well, I'll get the digit in, stop the dial tone, uh, set a timer, waiting for an interdigit timer, timeout, right? Press some more digits. Each time you press a digit, we have to figure out if that's an extension or where it's going. So we're translating each digit, right? Finally, you, you get to another, uh, you get to a number. Uh, so now you've got to start uh, telling the other phone what's going on. At the same time, you have to give uh, switch in another tone to give ring back to the user. And then you have to start ringing the phone, set a bunch of timing cadences, so on. They answer, once they answer, you have to remove the ring back tone, and then you have to set up a speech path, so you have to actually take the, the switch that's connecting the two parties and join them together. I'm a little bit in the old TDM, the old uh, uh, time division multiplex domain here. Uh, it's slightly different with, uh, with IP, but all of that stuff's going on, right? And then you compound that with uh, uh, features, so you want to set call forward on your phone, you hit the button, uh, your, uh, your display is going to give you some feedback saying enter the digit, uh, contact the, the keys on your phone are going to change if it's a modern phone, so on. So just trying to give you a little bit of idea of what's involved in the telephone switch if, if you weren't, uh, you know, if, if you're not like Johnny over here who thinks about it all the time. So what I'm going to cover in the next little bit is I'm going to talk about the product that, uh, that I've built with Alexer. Well, a piece of the product that's built with Elixir. I'm going to go through the, uh, the architecture to show you how I put this thing together. Uh, talk uh, about the, some of the challenges I faced and uh, some of the learnings uh, about porting a C application because my application was first written in C and then I ported it to Elixir. So I can talk a little bit about some of the experiences there. So who am I? Steve Palin, uh, I'm from Ottawa, eh? <laughs> so uh, Dave was mentioning earlier about his first programming language being basic. Uh, the first time I programmed, it was actually on a programmable calculator. Uh, I programmed Blackjack and, uh, on one of the old, uh, the old calculators with the uh, uh, LED displays. And so you know, when you lost, you had to flip it over upside down and you know, read, lose, right? Because you remember doing that, anyone? Um, this was before personal computers. I'd never heard of a personal computer. It was before VIC-20s and so on. So, uh, 26 years in telecommunications, various roles. And uh, I'm uh, the R&D lead and a partner in a startup called eMetrotel. 
So we have been in business for uh, a little over four years and we focus on uh, giving customers with legacy uh, equipment an upgrade path. Um, co the company that bought out our part, the bought out that part of Nortel uh, isn't really providing their, their uh, MDing or uh, getting rid of the product. And so we're coming in and offering uh, upgrading to modern features for these customers, millions and millions of lines out there, uh, and providing them nice, sexy features, but they can still keep their old handsets, their old telephones. So a lot of savings for them. So like I said, I originally wrote the application in C. Then Elixir came along, and I thought, oh, cool. That would be, really, uh, be really nice, because I really don't like writing in C. Uh, so I rewrote the complete version, uh, except for one little component. There's a, a piece, a Sun RPC uh, library that I wasn't able to find, and I didn't feel like writing it. Uh, I have since found an Erlang version, so my next job, once I uh, get this into our, al our alpha site next week, is to come back and rewrite that piece and get rid of that little C uh, service that I have running. Okay. Why did I do it? Well, all the reasons that we've been talking about today. Maintainability, less code. And it's just a heck of a lot more fun. So it's right now it's in our uh, product verification lab. And next week, it uh, should be in our alpha site. So I'm going to talk a little bit of product, just so you understand kind of some context here. So what, are we, what did we start with? We started with uh, our product, which is a PBX. It's uh, the core is an open source PBX called Asterix. I know a lot of people have heard about it. Uh, it supports, uh, we have it supporting SIP, and we also have it supporting some other vendors' IP-based telephones. Okay, so yeah, it's really a PC, actually, even better. So now, my, uh, my uh, 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 toy here doesn't fly, and it doesn't drive, so I was kind of disappointed. <laughs> actually, I'm really disappointed, because I fly model of helicopters for, uh, for a hobby, and so I was just drooling to take that thing for a rip, but... Uh, so it's, it's basically a P, uh, PC, so supporting IP phones is really easy because you just plug them into a, into a switch and connect it up and everything goes great. Uh, so we already, like I said, we already support the, uh, the legacy IP PBX phones. Okay, on the other hand, our customers have these, this end of life equipment, okay, huge installed base. Um, basically they've got all this funky hardware you know, big cabinets of hardware, and they have all the old TDM phones with the standard two-wire, uh, two-pair wires going into, into all this hardware. Um, fortunately, the main component that drives all that stuff does have an IP interface. So that's what I started with. And so what, the, what we're after, what, I, what we've built, is um, supporting all those phones through that IP interface on those gateways into our IP PBX so that all, uh, basically there's feature transparency and the phones work exactly the same way. So just to give you an idea of the scaling, uh, our target is to support up to 60 of these gateways and about 10,000 phones. I've got to look up here because I don't have my glasses on. Uh, like I said, it's the Sun RPC piece hasn't been done yet, uh, but uh, it should be done soon. And just, just talking about some of the things that I have to deal with here, uh, you know, accepting TCP or UDP links. Uh, RUDP is a reliable, RUD, uh, reliable UDP protocol uh, that uh, uh, it's kind of proprietary. It's just sequence numbers and stuff, retransmits and so on. Uh, line card installation, removal of these things. Just to give you an idea, of every gateway has um, five links, I think four TCP links, no, three TCP links and two RUDP links. Every telephone has an RUDP link, as well as, um, as another uh, uh, RTP, RU, uh, UDP link. So. Okay. Some of the phone features meant before, just to give you an idea, so we got to you know, uh, detect the phone, they have IDs, they have uh, serial numbers on them. Uh, we have to put, put uh, data on the display. 
tones I mentioned before, operational parameters, like the little lamps on there, drive, uh, drive that stuff. Uh, lots of state machines, uh, the telephony and uh, love state machines, uh, hence uh, Gen FSM. And uh, we have, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, handle DS, that's all right. I have a copy of Gemma, Gen, Gen FSM, it's in my project. I'm okay now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, with DSP resources that we have to manage and uh, we're off pulling these phones. So if you plug a new a phone in, we actually know it's there or if you unplug it, we know it's gone. Okay, so architecture. So uh, basically, it's an OP, OTP type architecture. So we have a supervisor. I start off with a supervisor. I start a bunch of singleton um, uh, gen servers. Uh, then I start up a, a gateway supervisor. Uh, it's responsible for gateway manager uh, signaling. Uh, this is where I start the uh, regent, uh, the, one of the or several regent uh, TCP acceptors. And uh, I got to dig out the glasses. Now I look like an old man. Okay, and uh, DSP, uh, DSP links. From there, start up a worker supervisor for every one of these gateways, up to 60 gateways that can connect. And it uh, manages, does, there's line cards in, in these things, so it manages the line cards. Uh, starts up a device supervisor for every device, every phone that connects. Uh, we have to do polling and uh, actually, sorry, devices supervisor, which then manages all the device supervisors. And it starts up a state machine for the device, starts up a call control state machine and an RUDP session. So uh, lots of state machines. Performance, actually it's kind of appropriate. I, I, now my performance isn't quite as, uh, as um, fancy as the last presentation, but uh, uh, so we run this, we run this service uh, on the same server as our asterisk server, uh, just because um, uh, enterprises are pretty cheap in buying equipment uh, because they have to pay all y'all, pay y'all lots of bucks, right? So. Uh, to write software. Uh, so we need to support up to eight calls per second. Uh, it's mainly just the setup and teardown messaging. Uh, approximately 50 messages per call. Average, let's say, 10 bytes per call or 10 bytes per message. And do the housekeeping, phone, the heart beating and, and phone messages and all that stuff. Uh, definitely I don't get the same capacity as I did with C. Uh, I haven't really ran any fancy benchmarks. I've you know loaded it up and run top and kind of watch it. it you know, try, it's a little more peaky than the, the C application. I guess I'm at uh, probably about a 40 to 50 percent reduction in capacity with this solution. Um, the way I sold it is. Elixir is great to, you know, we can just split things apart, run this over here, this over here. So when we get to the size where we're actually handling 10,000 phones, um, we'll be, uh, there'll be very large deployments. We'll be able to put extra hardware in there and kind of split it apart. So, and that seemed to uh, appease my business partner. So uh, I'm just going to walk through some of the more interesting, well, my view of the more interesting th uh, things parts of this uh, application. So logging, so uh, built the original version, the C version to uh, uh, use syslog, so we wanted to keep with syslog. Um, I actually ported the uh, Erlang's twig to Elixir. After I finished porting it, I kind of questioned why I ported it, but it was fun. So I, I guess I just wanted the experience of seeing what it'd be like to, to actually bring it over. So, uh, so I ported that and then I think three weeks later, Jose comes out with, hey, we got a grand, brand new great logger. And actually I, I, I say that joking because I knew it was coming. Uh, so uh, my next step is to actually try to bring syslog into, uh, into the new logger. 
So um, with all this stuff going on, all the state machines and so on, I just wasn't happy with your standard three or four levels of debug um, severities and our ser severities in logging. So I uh, implemented a, uh, a category so I can actually fine tune it and I can set up categories in different modules and so on and then I can turn those categories off and on to, to really fine tune the logging. Um, typically we need a certain level of logging in the product so when something happens you know, we ha we'll have to go in, turn on the logging and so on. Um, but I will probably turn off the highest level debug logging so I actually use all macros for my, uh, I've wrapped the logging with my own API. It's macro based. And so I can actually just go in the code and turn off a logging level. And when I compile it, it just compiles out all the code. So, so from a performance perspective, I saw a big, a big increase uh, with, uh, with turning, actually turning off the call. So. Configuration and administration. So I had, like I said, I had a C program. We already had a config file and so on. So I had to, uh, I wrote a config file parser, yet another config file parser. Um, you know, we, uh, we generate config files through a web interface. And uh, uh, one thing I don't have yet is I haven't built in the, the ability to uh, change those uh, logging levels on the fly. So right now it reads the logging levels at uh, boot, so I have to come back and start kicking processes to reread the uh, config files if they change. Uh, the other thing from a kind of configuration administration or debugging is uh, I have a fairly elaborate uh, console-based commands that I have in there. And uh, I want to get those accessible from the web page. I haven't done that yet. And I'll actually talk about that in now. So, uh, so basically, in my C version, I had a, you know, I, I, I just had a console program that read a string and parsed it out and did all that stuff for the, uh, for the logging, or for the uh, uh, console commands. Uh, with Elixir, I just use IEX. And uh, uh, so it, it uh, and basically I just store, put import console into the, uh, the uh, IEX, uh, EXS file. And then the, the, I don't have to worry about the namespacing for the commands. So there's probably about 30 or 40 commands in there. Um, so I built it around so it, it uh, detects the commands uh, with help so that there's a help or a help command to, to get the help on the commands. Uh, I actually implemented it with, uh, with macros. And uh, the other benefit now is it has the full power of the console, right? So you run a run one of my, my commands in the thing and you can assign that to a variable and pipe it and do all fancy stuff, so it's pretty cool that way. Um, it always bothered me when I was working on the C version. If I, wanted to, if I wanted to add a new command to the console, I had to go up and I had to, put the, uh, had to put a prototype at the top of the file and then I had it in a list and I had to put the name of the, of the, of the procedure and then I had to uh, put the help state uh, the help strings in there and then I had to go down below and put the body in it was just it always bothered me right so the new version the elixir version basically I have a macro called command and I just call the macro and the first item is the name of the command a description your help description and then a list of uh, a list of parameters and then the body of the uh, body of the command so now when I want to go in out a command it's like you know three lines of code, so. so I was pretty excited about that. Of course, the help, the help actually knows, knows that, so you don't have to do anything from the help. The help system reads all that, so. So uh, another challenge I had, uh, coming from a C background, and I still struggle whether I'm just too C-oriented or something like that, but I had a, a whole, a lot of uh, defined constants in C. And uh, things like defining the, the values that should be in a binary protocol, right? The, you know, the different commands or all the, all the arguments. And so I was, I was trying to figure out how I do the concept, uh, I guess like a, an HRL file in, in uh, Erlang. And uh, I wasn't able to figure it out. So I ended up writing a macro to kind of do this so that I could, def I could def uh, put all my defines in one file and then share, or one module, and share them between modules. 
So module attributes don't work because you can't access them from, access them from different, uh, different uh, modules. Now, I'm, I'm waiting for someone to actually come and say, Steve, you didn't have to do it. It was this easy, but uh, I'll buy you a beer if you do. So. Okay, so uh, to, use, to use this, uh, use this I, uh, so basically you define your module, you, and, and I actually called it define, um, and then the name of the, the, the uh, constant and then the value, um, and then uh, when you want to use it, uh, here's an example where I'm using it inside a function, so it's being used as a match. So one of the advantages of this is that, uh, that I can actually use it in matches and so on. So. And, uh, and there's the implementation. So uh, macros are cool. I love macros. So that's how I solve the shared module constants. Now I have, I have to say, you know, not every, I didn't use that for everything. So, uh, you know, where I would, uh, in C, if I was parsing a, a binary protocol and, you know, I wanted to name some of the parameters in there, in C, I would create a define uh, with the value of the parameter and then, you know, when I receive that message, I'd do a switch on the, on the constant, right? Um, those were really ugly because, uh, you know, I just didn't like that. So in Elixir, you know, I have a parser that pulls it in and if I don't need the value, I actually just turn it into an atom. So then, you know, I'm returning from my parser a tuple with the atom and, and all the data or just the, or just the atom. Uh, so the code's a lot cleaner now because I'm looking at, you know, looking at atoms and, and uh, when I'm logging, I'm just doing an inspect on that message. So my inspect comes out as atoms versus in C when I would, uh, if I'd log, my log was actually printing out the value of the constant, which was a number and then I had to figure out what the name was, so. Uh, hex numbers, I ended up uh, playing around with ways of logging, so everything I do is in, in hex, or all the binary protocols I'm parsing is in, is in hex. So uh, I ended up, at first I tried to override the, uh, all the inspector, override's not the right word, but uh, create a protocol or def, the implementation to kind of uh, all inspect prints out hex, but that was kind of ugly. So I ended up just implementing an inspect hex that I can throw at anything and it just, it'll dump out uh, all the integers in hex. Uh, one of the patterns I was continually facing is I do a lot of Wireshark uh, captures. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll do a Wireshark ca capture. It'll have a nice hex string of the, of the binary data coming across the wire. And then I want to write a test case to use that data, right? So, you know, I was copying it and I was putting it in the editor and then I was doing a search and replace on all the spaces and putting commas in there and inserting OX in front of all the numbers. So, because it's coming out like that string there. Uh, and so I'd have to put OX in front and I thought, this is kind of silly after doing it a hundred times. So I just wrote a, a simple uh, seagull uh, that basically allows me so here it is here, so in the comment, so uh, just tilde H and then the, the hex string and it, it pops out uh, uh, the list of numbers, so. So that was kind of handy for my, especially for the tests. And there's the implementation. So I love how short the implementation is. Uh, now, I don't know. This 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 one this one might get get me uh, get me raked a little bit, but uh, so you know the the one nice thing about programming C is the ability to to find a structure that overlays your binary protocol, right? So you you know you have a, a binary message come in memory, and you just point the point your structure your structure pointer to that message, and now you can just pull out the fields through uh, through dot, right? So you know there's there's an example there of of bit fields. And I really didn't have the equivalent. I played around with a couple different ways of doing this. And uh, I ended up with, so I ended up with this. So this is, this is actually a te the test case. So, uh, so I create a structure, um, define the fields of the structure, and then I introduced uh, the C structure uh, macros that allow me to define the schema and the Indianness. 
So here, uh, the, the subdata three, it basically the schema is, uh, is two, two, a uh, 16-bit number and an 8-bit number, okay? And then just to show kind of the complexity, the second one, the my list records two, so this was written with records, uh, and then convert to structs. Uh, so this one, actually, the schema is a, uh, the first, first element called one is actually a list, and then defining the list, and uh, uh, in, in the uh, two, it's a list of records, and so on. And uh, so this gives me the ability to uh, define a, a complex message, a fairly large binary complex message with nested fields and so on, and be able to pull those out individually. So, and uh, it seemed to work pretty well. I used it for a number of protocols uh, that I had already in C, and it was pretty easy to just translate this. So, so. Uh, we're on Linux, uh, Red Hat, uh, a, well, CentOS to be specific. And uh, so from packaging, uh, packaging and installation, uh, I used EXRM to actually build the, uh, build the package. Uh, it's a great tool. Uh, so it builds a package of the application with the Erlang and the Elixir's uh, runtime. Uh, so no need to, when I first started doing this, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to write an RPM to install Erlang and write an R RPM to install Elixir and stuff like that. Then I found this thing. Oh, wow, this is great. So, so you just run release and it packages all that together. And um, then I got to think, oh, okay, well, now I've got to create an RPM. And uh, I hate creating RPMs. Like, you know, so you take a, a, a template spec file and uh, sorry if people don't know. So RPM is the Red Hat Package Manager. So it's the, the package manager that uh, Red Hat based distributions use. So you take the spec file over, you, uh, and then you, change, you know, change all the stuff, and then you need to uh, be able to start and stop the service, and you need the service to run, uh, to automatically start. So you, you know, you've got to create an init script, edit all that, all the cut and paste stuff, and you know, three, four hours, five hours later, you have an RPM. So uh, I wrote an RPM generator. It's actually a plug-in to EXRM. And now if you want to create a, you know, create a new project, mix new, yada, 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 uh, hit, your, uh, hit your depths and put in the uh, EXRM uh, RPM. And uh, then you, well, you do a depths, uh, depths get. And, and then you just run uh, uh, mix RPM minus minus, uh, mix release minus minus RPM, and uh, you have an RPM. So. And then if you want to customize it, uh, if you want to actually, you know, there's a whole bunch of customization. It reads the config file. There's a bunch of stuff in there. But if you actually need to change the, the call flow, like the actual procedural stuff, there's a create templates, and that just copies the template into a, uh, another location. You can edit that, and then when you create an RPM, if it uh, finds that, the newer version, it'll use that instead of the built-in template. So. And uh, that's, where, that's been working great for me. So I'm looking forward to building the next 10 projects so that I don't have to spend all the time creating RPMs. Testing. So early in the project, I was looking for, uh, I was looking for um, uh, mocking, and I came across Amrita. Is the person who wrote it here? So um, a great, a great product. I, 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 I love it, actually. I really like it. So it's got, you know, mockings built in, uh, but, you know, and it has a nesting of, of tests. So, you know, a fact and then facts, and, or you can use tests and tests. Or if you're from the, the, the uh, RSpec world, you can use describe and it. Uh, so, uh, so it has all those great features. Uh, but it hasn't been updated for a while. And so I actually, my product is still on 13.2. And the only reason I got to 13.2 is I had to go in and, and do, the, do the changes to get it, I think, from 12 up to 13. Uh, and so I think it's to, for me to get up to 14 or ultimately one, I'll, I'll probably be going in and doing uh, all the record to structs conversion. So. so I, I typically do excellent test coverage if I'm building like platform type libraries. Uh, that's nice and easy. My call processing code and all the all the the fancy stuff 
uh, my test coverage isn't near what it what uh, what it is for uh, for this the the easier stuff. So uh, I probably could spend more time doing trying to do that to that test coverage, but it gets pretty. Sometimes it gets pretty delicate. And the other thing I did is uh, I wrote a uh, simulator to, to simulate phones. Uh, so I you know, run another Elixir program, and it'll come up, and it'll talk to, the, talk to this app uh, and uh, say, uh, you know, I've got a whole bunch of phones. And, uh, uh, and then I can you know, test that. And the neat thing about it is I can then drive uh, SIP traffic. I can drive a, a, phone, a physical phone generator into the call server into the PBX, and then it actually starts telling these phones to ring and, and answer and so on. So I can actually do a pretty good job of simulating hundreds of phones for performance testing. What am I doing for time? Oh, doing well. OK, so benefits. Uh, supervisors, they're awesome. Uh, so on my C version, guess what happens when I get a bug and I've got uh, a thousand phones on the system? So, and who, who's used to actually picking up their phone and not getting dial tone? Right? No. So uh, phone th users of phones and companies that use phones are very particular about their system being up. And uh, so I get, a, I get a problem, I get a seg fault, boom, all the phones are down. Right, yeah, I, I restart the application. It comes back up in, you know, phones to register and stuff. Maybe depending on how big the system is, anywhere from 45 seconds to, you know, maybe five minutes. Uh, but that's one bug, right? And that's really anywhere, any seg fold anywhere. So with Alexa, uh, you know, the best case, I have a bug and I just drop the message. Okay, if I actually spawned a handler for the message. You know, sometimes I just dump them into, into the state machine. In that case, I take down the state machine, which takes down one phone. Okay, so, and then, you know, I guess if I had something in the handling of a gateway, you know, I might take down one gateway and the other 59 stay up. So, you know, fault tolerance, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, live upgrade, so uh, use this in production and, uh, you know, that's my, work, my workflow, right? So I want to change something. System's running. I'll edit the code and just uh, R the R the module, and poof, I'm up and running. I don't have to take it down. Come up, register all the phones, and so on. Uh, remote console. Uh, I love the I love the uh, the the uh, Revel and uh, multi-node scalability. So I'm looking forward to that when we get really big and make <coughs> lots of money. And uh, it's a heck of a lot easier to maintain. So a lot less code and no semaphores. <laughs> no pointer corruption. <laughs> no seg faults. Although I've crashed Erlang a few times, but <laughs> actually the uh, the uh, um, the viewer, the whatever it dumps out, the uh, the the Erlang core file, the viewer works pretty well. So that's pretty cool. Challenges. So it was a piece of cake. There was uh, no issues. Uh, you know, a week later, I had it up and running. So, uh, so challenges. Well, I've got to train people in Elixir. So, uh, and I also had to sell the fact that Steve, you want to do something that there's not really a big uh, uh, resource pool for. Uh, team buy-in. So I had uh, had some challenges with team buy-in uh, and uh, so it, with respect to the effort to port it and the time to market because we had a C version we were already out in production with that but I uh, managed to get through that. Uh, I actually learned Elixir, functional programming and architecting the solution all at the same time about uh, four to five months ago. So that was, uh, that's about the most time I actually had to sit down and work through an architecture. Uh, I wanted to get the supervisor model right and so on. So uh, it, took me, it, took me, it took me weeks actually. And I, I, you know, I, I'm not a, a patient person, so I like to get in and just you know, start building up and start building up. 
And I did that for a little bit to prototype some stuff, but then I had to step back. And so, so that was challenging. Um, excited about the next one now. The uh, language during Elixir, that was a little challenging. Uh, the, uh, the biggest one was records to structs. That took me by surprise. Uh, but then uh, I started watching the uh, mailing lists more. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> fortunately I really, I really over abuse the kind of what I call the OO ability of records, right? So, uh, so your custom functions, uh, didn't, you didn't have to pass it the, the actual uh, um, struct or the record, it was, it was implicit, right? So, so converting that, there, I think there were like 25 or 30 records uh, with usage across even more files. So it took me a few days to do that, uh, that refactor, but uh, I like the new one better now. So but I'll tell you, when I was refactoring it, I wasn't. So. Uh, yeah, so 25 records. Uh, yeah, and it, we definitely need to get uh, more investment in the ecosystem. There's still, you know, we're, we're in the early stages, and uh, it's not a complaint. I love being in the early stages, right? Being able to get in and, and actually mold the language, influence the language, uh, have some good discussions on... Uh, and all uh, the test framework that I mentioned before. So what's the summary? Well, the experience has pre been pretty good. Great community. I've had uh, fun, uh, actually I'm fun here too. And uh, looking forward to, uh, well it's great to be involved with, with uh, the pre 1.0. This is my first time, actually I haven't really been an active member in, uh, in, in, different, in open source communities before. Uh, so getting in and kind of helping influence it and, and stuff has been pretty cool. Uh, I love Elixir. I hate C. Elixir! Yeah. Yeah. It's been a pretty modest, uh, modest transition from Ruby. Uh, I'm not sure that, oh, that's a summary. Sorry, I was back on the challenges. Uh, I built a better product. So. A lot better product. I'm really happy with the way the Elixir uh, version turned out. And looking forward to uh, 1.0 and hey, Jose rocks, man. So good job building this, uh, building this. <laughs> question. I'll start with the questions. Um, oh. yeah, have you used Adhesion? Adhesion, yes. Matter of fact, I want to I want to port it. I want an Elixir version of it here. I have it in a product. You have so it in what? I have. I, I use it in a product. Okay. Okay. So the question is, have I used it here? Adhesion is a Ruby framework, uh, almost like a model view controller type framework for voice uh, applications. So it'll hook into different PBXs, and you can create applications that has controllers, that type of thing. Uh, it mirrors very well with Ruby on Rails too, because you can share active record between your adhesion and your uh, uh, Rails. And of course, anytime you build a voice application, you need configuration management, that type of thing, which you can throw in uh, uh, in Rails. So, so and and uh, my next project, I would like to try. Uh, I haven't done any web development yet with Elixir, but I'd love to do. And and I have a number of projects in Rails already. I'd like to try moving over there, and in that case, I'd like to try to get something in Elixir like Adhesion. So, cool. Um, when you said you couldn't use attributes for to replace your defines, did you try using register attribute because it keeps the attribute permanent, so you can access it externally with get attribute? No, I didn't try that actually. Yeah, so one of the docs, I don't remember if it's Dave's book or if it's on the Gain Started thing, but it says if you want to expose your um, module variables as constants use register uh, attribute. I missed that. So then you just use the name, the I guess the namespace of the of the module, and then whatever the ax, whatever. Uh, no, the you have to. I think it's a method on the module module. So you do module okay. dot get attribute. Yeah. The you pass in the module and you pass in the attribute to look up. Okay. And that way you can access it externally because I guess module attributes and 
in Erlang are always preserved, but they're not in e Elixir, and so that turns them into Erlang style okay. uh, module attributes. So, and then I guess I would also question whether you could put that in a match. I, I, I would doubt that would fit in a match. So, one of the, one of the requirements I had, oh, okay. One of the requirements I had was, uh, uh, yeah, so, was putting in a Mac, so. So you have a couple options. One of them is to define them as a macro, as you did. Yeah. The other one would be you could define a macro that basically inject all the attributes in a place, and then you use them as attributes. So for example, you, you did use constants. And then you could have in your using callback, you could just define all the attributes in there, and then they would be available to all modules. And you could use them as attributes everywhere. Okay. And, and you could register attributes as well. Uh, and the idea of registering attributes is that they are going to be stored in, in the beam code. So those they would all be at compile time, and they would, okay. you know, they would be replaced and so on. Okay. And when they are storing the beam code, you can, after the module is, lo is loaded, you can access them, but access them as a function call. So you would need to have another way to access those registered attributes in pattern matches or something like that. Okay. So they, were, they would all options yeah. and they, okay. they could, all, could all work in a way or the other. Now, uh, am I allowed to ask a question or? <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple one. Yeah, yeah, sure. Why not HRL files in oh, Elixir? Yeah. Why not? Why not in, like like the uh, Erlang include files? Why why not something like that in Elixir? Yeah, so you can achieve exactly the same thing with okay. macros, right? Okay. That you could do with the include files. Yeah. So maybe we need a better mechanism for defining constants that are reachable from different places. But I don't think we need to have uh, the include files exactly because that's exactly what you get with macros. Okay. Okay. So it just, just, and I get, I get what you're saying, but what, I think what we need is something that's fairly easy to do and easy to get to, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I've got to solve for myself now, but uh, you know, I guess if anyone else wants to do it, they're going to have to come and get my code. So. Uh, okay, uh, another question. Uh, I had a follow-up. So you're doing like a phone thing, and Erlang was developed for phones, and. Um, Joe Armstrong, you know, one of the guys that wrote Erlang and was in the development, actually did his uh, thesis in 2003 on a Ericsson phone product. That right. seems really similar to your phone product. Did you read that thesis and see the problems he had doing phone products in the Erlang VM? So I did not read the thesis. I know that Ericsson had built a phone product uh, in Erlang. Um, I use that as a selling point. Uh, but no, I haven't read that, and I, so I don't know the challenges he faced. So, but it's good. Uh, I'm going to go and find it. So. Yeah, one of the things yeah. he said was the they couldn't keep all the calls active. They had actually kind of preserve processes offline after the call setup happened, and then like bring it back to life when the call teardown, teardown happened, so that they could get higher performance. So now, they, uh, from what I understand, they built a class five switch, which is a you know the switch that services your home, and they're huge, right? So I, I'm in the enterprise market, and offices aren't, just aren't that big. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping I wouldn't have the same problem, but I will definitely read that. And... So um, a few years ago, I worked on a project. We were reporting something with a, a fairly hefty amount of use of uh, C bit fields uh, from a uh, Solaris system, um, all on Spark to Intel-based Linux. And, we discovered that uh, bit fields were not guaranteed by any sort of standard to actually be serialized in a given order if you just dump them straight to memory. And so we, uh, we, a lot of the team members lost a lot of hair over that one. Um, but another thing we ran into was really bad logging uh, facilities available to really make sense of binary data in a useful way. And I've seen some of the stuff that was uh, offered in um, the documentation for dealing with the uh, bit-specific uh, data structures. I was wondering, since you talked about logging, um, did you find that creating things that gave you detailed information about the uh, bitwise stuff was easy, or was the uh, existing functionality enough to handle what you needed? So so I did do a lot of, actually on the C version, I did a lot of effort there. So 
when I was trying to, to, uh, to, to look at binary data and, uh, and understand it, I actually wrote, uh, this was before Elixir, so I wrote a parser, a lo uh, uh, basically a binary file parser in Ruby that would take and print it out in some format that uh, I, can, uh, I could understand. Um, when I actually did the logging system in the C version, I then enhanced that thing to actually parse the logs I was printing out in the C version to filter them down and print out similar stuff. So I've spent a lot of time working on logging. Uh, actually, uh, the log, my log, I'm still not finished with the Elixir version. It's still not quite as good as the C version. So, um, but there are definitely some benefits, like being able to, you know, since I parse out a message and I have a tuple in there to, exp to describe the message and particular things, uh, not tuple, an atom, right? Then when I just dump that thing out, I actually get the atom instead of getting a number and so. But there's, it, there's a, lot of, a lot of work. And then you also have to look at the level of logging, right? So, you know, and, and then the filtering, right? So if I want, you know, if there's a thousand phone calls going on, right, and I want to look at one phone call, well, you know, I got to try to figure out how to pick out that one phone call. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so you talked a little bit about the release process. Um, for me, that's been probably the most difficult part um, is generating releases in a continuous delivery manner. Um, I was curious, you chose RPMs and you're using RELUPS in each of them. So when you install an RPM, does it just run the RELUPS script to something that's already running or? So yeah, so I basically, I, if, if it's already install, I installed, I run the RELUPS script. If it's not installed, I, uh, I, uh, I install it. And the RPM? In knows the RPM. What to do. Yeah, so I have code in the RPM. And it's actually in the template, right? So that's the default. Uh, I've been debating on whether I want to switch between do a delete, like take it down, put the new code in and bring it back up versus doing the, the rel up. Um, yeah, the problem with doing the rel up is you have to make sure you've done all your, uh, you know, you've done all your, your migrations, right? So, and, and I'm a little worried about other people coming in and once the, the development team gets bigger, right? So I'm thinking I'm going to put a, a switch in there and I might even turn it off by default. So, um, so in the RPM you contain both the rel up and the full installation? Do you make two releases at release time? Uh, no. Uh, no. What, so if... So let me think. Um, I can't remember the code now, but uh, so I z uh, zip the thing or un untar it, and then no. So 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 I know I know if it's already running, if it's already there, right? Okay, if yeah, it's yeah. already there, I just kick the rel up, right? If it's not there, I put it there and then just start it. Are so. you doing anything uh, in an environment where? Per Potentially, you hadn't upgraded it yet. Like, uh, if you run that RPM and you attempt to run the rel up, but the version that's running isn't compatible with the rel up, what do you do with that? Is there? I haven't handled that uh, that non sunny day. That's, yeah, that's the case. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to that either. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. So, and in that case, what I'd need to do is I'd need to you know, I need to put those conditions in the spec file, right? So uh, you know to look for that error code and then handle it. So. Uh, you know, once I come across that, I would modify the template, uh, in, you know, in the next release. release so. Any more questions? All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.